Welcome. In this lesson, we'll confirm what you've already known all along. Adding heat to something increases its temperature. In the same way, taking heat away from something decreases its temperature. This fact is neatly summarized in the equation Q equals MC delta T. Now, this is a two-part series because there are two flavors of calorimetry problem. This video will discuss thermal equilibration. It is well known that if we add energy to a substance, the temperature will increase. For example, if we add 4.18 kilojoules of energy to a liter of water, the temperature of the water will increase by exactly one degree Celsius. What you may not know is that if you add the same amount of energy to a different substance, such as one kilogram of iron, the temperature will increase by a different amount. We symbolize the amount of temperature change as delta T. Each material in the universe has a value called its specific heat, abbreviated as C sub S. The specific heat is the amount of heat energy needed to raise the temperature of one gram of the substance by one degree Celsius. The units are joules per gram degree Celsius. You may recall that one degree Celsius is the same size as one Kelvin, so the units are also often written as joules per gram Kelvin. If we rearrange the equation for specific heat, we get Q equals mass times specific heat times change in temperature. Colloquially, many people say this is Q equals MC delta T or Q equals M cap. This equation allows us to calculate heat flow for an object when the object's temperature changes. Every object in the universe has a unique specific heat and you won't need to memorize any in my class. But I would like to point out that the specific heat of water, 4.184 joules per gram Kelvin, is astronomically higher than any other substance on the list. Water has the highest specific heat of any common substance on our planet. This is the reason that Earth's temperature is so stable compared to the temperatures of other planets in our solar system. It takes a huge amount of heat to change the temperature of water. It's also why water is our substance of choice to keep materials cold for an extended period of time. Let's do a quick practice problem to see how well you understand the concept of specific heat. If we have two substances, X and Z, with the same mass and they are heated with the same amount of thermal energy, which substance will have a higher final temperature? I like to think of specific heat as the energy cost of raising one gram of substance by one degree Celsius. So it takes 0.35 joules of cash to raise one gram of X by one degree, and it takes 0.895 joules of cash to raise one gram of Z by one degree. Which one's a better value? Sample X, and sample X will have a higher final temperature. Remember, the focus of this chapter is energy. And one common way we measure energy change is by tracking heat flow. Heat flow changes the substance's temperature, and we will use the equation Q equals MC delta T often in this class. For example, it's very easy to measure the temperature change of a substance. And in your calorimetry lab during week five, you'll measure the temperature change during a chemical reaction and use this equation to calculate how much heat was involved in that temperature change. You only need to know M and C, the mass and the specific heat, to calculate the heat flow. The process of measuring heat flow using temperature change is called calorimetry. In your lab experiment, you'll be constructing your own coffee cup calorimeter. Uh, and also in including a thermometer to measure the change in temperature. You'll put water in the calorimeter and then measure the change in temperature of the water during a chemical reaction. We'll use Q equals MCAT to calculate how much heat was involved in the change. It's useful to define the system and the surroundings during a calorimetry experiment. We assume that the calorimeter is isolated from the rest of the universe. In other words, we assume that the calorimeter is perfectly insulated. So the surroundings which absorb the heat is just the water inside the calorimeter. Now, there are two kinds of calorimetry experiment, 
thermal equilibration and reaction enthalpy. What we consider as the system depends on which type of calorimetry experiment we do, which you'll see shortly. This video covers thermal equilibration, where the system is some object with a higher or lower temperature. For instance, imagine dropping a hot piece of metal into water. The water's temperature will increase as the metal cools down. For the other type of calorimetry experiment, we'll be interested in reaction enthalpy. So in that case, the system is a chemical reaction of some sort. We'll see that dissolving some salts in water causes a temperature change. In both of these calorimetry experiments, we know that the first law of thermodynamics remains true. The energy of the universe is constant. So the heat change of the system will be exactly opposite to the heat change of the surroundings. This sounds complicated, don't worry. We'll put it in practice shortly. But before we practice these two types of calorimetry problems, we wanna know how do we tell which one we're dealing with? Well, ask yourself the question, is a reaction involved? If there is no reaction involved, then we are likely dealing with a thermal equilibration problem. These problems usually take the form of a hot thing was added to a cold thing. The hot thing cooled down, the cold thing warmed up, calculate the final temperature of the things. In this kind of process, the system is one object and the surroundings are the other object. The heat comes from the hot object and flows to the cold object until both objects reach the same temperature. Because water is so good at absorbing heat, it's often involved in these problems and you usually consider it as the surroundings but the distinction is somewhat arbitrary. If there is a reaction involved, then we're dealing with a different kind of problem. In this case, the heat comes from energy stored inside a chemical reaction and then flows out into the surroundings as the reaction occurs. We'll cover this in the next video. We'll next practice a thermal equilibration problem. We'll take a hot piece of metal and drop it into some room temperature water. But before we jump in, I wanna run through the important math. We'll start with the first law of thermodynamics. The change of the system plus the heat change of the surroundings will equal zero. In this case, the system will be object A, our hot piece of metal, and the surroundings will be object B, the cold water. We can write a Q equals MCAT expression for both A and B. Uh, each object will have its own mass, its own heat capacity, and its own initial temperature. Note that the final temperature will be the same since this is a thermal equilibration problem where the hot thing and the cold thing exchange heat until they reach the same final temperature. So let's imagine a chemist has a piece of metal which weighs 26 grams and they heat the metal up to 100 degrees Celsius. Then they place it in 52.1 grams of water in a calorimeter at 20 degrees. When the sample reaches thermal equilibrium, the temperature of this the temperature of the two objects is the same, which is 24 degrees Celsius. Calculate the specific heat of the metal. Pause the video, see if you can solve it without my help. We'll start with the first law of thermodynamics. Q system plus Q surroundings equals zero. In this problem, I consider the system to be the hot piece of metal and the surroundings are the room temperature water. I'll need to set up equations for both Q metal and Q water. The heat change in the metal is equal to M cat for the metal, which is the mass of the metal, times the specific heat of the metal, which is unknown, times the change in temperature of the metal. Change in temperature is always calculated as final temperature minus initial temperature. So in this case, 24 degrees minus 100 degrees. If we simplify the math, I get negative 1,976 times the specific heat of the metal. The heat change of the water is equal to Q equals M cat for the water. That is the mass of the water times the specific heat of the water times the temperature change of the water. We know all of these values from the problem and plugging them in gives us positive 871.9 joules. Lastly, I plug the results in of the red part and the purple part into the original equation and solve for the C of the metal. I get 0.441 joules per gram Kelvin. 
or degree Celsius. There are many places to go astray in this chapter, so I want to point out a good way to check your answer. Is this answer reasonable? Well, I think so for two reasons. First, it's a positive number, and heat capacity is always a positive value. Second, remember that water has the highest heat capacity of any common substance. So the heat capacity of our metal needs to be less than the heat capacity of water, which this value is. Lastly, before we finish up, I need to make a distinction between two types of heat capacity. The first type we've already discussed. It's specific heat, which is the amount of heat needed to raise one gram of a material by one degree Celsius. The second type of heat capacity is the heat capacity of a calorimeter. Admittedly, this doesn't come up a lot in Chem 101, but when you get to physical chemistry, you'll use something called a bomb calorimeter, which is a big piece of metal submerged in some water. This piece of equipment is custom made to study calorimetry problems, so some smart engineers have determined exactly how much heat it takes to raise the entire thing by one degree Celsius. This way, you don't have to bother with knowing the mass of the bomb calorimeter or the specific heat of each individual material in the bomb calorimeter. Instead, you'll just use the heat capacity of the entire calorimeter. Now, this is usually only used in bomb calorimetry problems. And the best way to tell this kind of problem apart from a specific heat problem is to look at the units. The heat capacity for the bomb calorimeter will not have grams or moles on the bottom. Although this distinction might be confusing between the two types of C, it actually makes our math easier for bomb calorimetry problems.